Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'll use Mike O'Neill's phrase since we have him here with us today. So um, welcome to the Three Principles Global Community. Um, Three Principles Global Community, also known as 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. So today we have Michael Neal with us. Michael, if you don't already know him, is an internationally renowned transformative coach and the best-selling author of several books, including Creating the Impossible, The Inside Out Revolution, and The Space Within. Michael is often described as the coach's coach and commands extraordinary respect within his field for unleashing the human potential with intelligence, humor, and heart. He spent over 25 years as a coach, advisor, friend, mentor, and creative spark plug to celebrities, CEOs, royalty, and people who want to get more out of themselves and their lives. His books have been translated into 18 languages, and his public talks, retreats, seminars, and online programs have touched and transformed lives at the United Nations and in over 60 countries and six continents around the world. Um, I will post more information about Michael and also um, his website in case you want to get in touch with him underneath the recording of this video on YouTube. So I just wanted to get that out there. And um, so Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Cool. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, so they make you come up with topics for these. and. The upside to that is it, it, it sort of makes it more inviting if you come up with a good topic, kind of like, um, I don't know, the, the, the 3P equivalent of quick clickbait, right? It would be like, secret Sid Banks never told you. <gasps> I want to go on that one, right? But, but the problem with coming up with a topic is that it, it gives you time to think before you have to speak. And... One of the things that I'll be talking about is how we're designed to do really well without too much time to think, without too much thinking on our mind. And, and so I kind of overthought this one a little bit. And then I kind of also knew better because one of the other things that happens is you start to get a feel from when you're overthinking things, when the smoke begins coming out of your ears and the you know, your head feels full and the world feels heavy because you've just got so much weighing on your mind. And so I kind of saw that it probably wasn't a good idea to think about it anymore. And then my dog came up to me and that was, that was, uh, that was good because we had a chat and, and, and he reminded me of where the topic came from, why I came up with the idea of being unleashed. And it was him. It was actually him specifically, and watching him, we go hiking up near my house, and there's a, a, a road called Dirt Mulholland, and it used to be the road that ran through the valley, the length of the, the San Fernando Valley, but it's closed to traffic, large chunks of it, so they just call it Dirt Mulholland now, and it's a hiking trail. And when I hike up there with him, I take him off the lead, and he sits and he waits, and when I say, okay, he bolts and there is so much joy in him pulling down Dirt Mulholland. I mean, it is, it, 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 it does something for my heart to watch him run, right? And he runs and runs. And then at some point he kind of comes back and hangs with me for a while and then he'll run off for a while and then he'll come and hang with me. And we have a really nice walk and I've got a, a young puppy um, who may make an appearance at some point here because she's trapped in a room and she doesn't like that. But, but she's not yet as well-conditioned, as well-trained as Pepper. So when you unleash her, she literally takes off before you can do anything. So she doesn't get unleashed very often because she hasn't yet been conditioned by us for what we think will keep her safe. And that's kind of both halves of the metaphor for what I wanted us to just explore together today. On the one hand, the opportunity to experience the absolute freedom of being unleashed, 
the absolute ability to just go anywhere we want to go in our minds, absolute freedom of mind, and to explore. And as we do that, of course, it also opens up our lives in the world. But then also, what is the conditioning that causes us to wait for permission before we take off? before we allow ourselves to really experience the freedom even after we've been unleashed. So when I first heard Sid Bank say, every human being is sitting in the middle of mental health. They just don't know it. I suddenly realized there's a giant cat. Come, oh no, okay, that's just, that's fine. Sorry, you guys can't see it, but a giant cat literally just, just filled the screen and I thought it was eating somebody, but it wasn't, it was just a camera angle. Um, <laughs> we were born into the absolute freedom of mind, infinite intelligence, infinite awareness, infinite creativity, infinite love, infinite freedom. But for some reason, and I'm not going to make a strong case right now that it's a good thing or a bad thing, letting all that unlimited creative potential loose without any conditioning isn't the way things are done here, right? And I suspect it's similar to why we train our dogs, right? Because we think it's safer if we can condition them. It's safer if they learn to follow directions instead of always just following what's inside them. Because we fear that what is inside them could get them killed or could cause them to hurt somebody. We don't want that to happen. So we condition them, we train them, right? And if you're very disciplined about the conditioning, you can, you can you know, have a dog that will do amazing things. But the nature, underneath the conditioning before the conditioning is still free we were born free and i know that's a song cue and it's taking everything in me not to kind of sing it out but but literally we're born into an innate freedom an innate well-being a world of pure possibility and then the conditioning shrinks it and shrinks it and shrinks it and we know the conditioning has really worked when they do it to themselves, right? So I know I've really trained my dog well when he sits before I ask him to. Well, we know we've been trained really well when we hold ourselves back before somebody tells us to, when we stop ourselves before somebody tells us to stop, when we don't go forward without somebody even having to be there to tell us, don't go forward. But see, with a dog, it looks like a really good thing that they're trained, right? We want our, 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 our dogs, we want other people's dogs to be well-trained, well-conditioned, right? Good boy, right? You don't say good boy for running free. You say good boy, good girl, for when they do what you want. And that's what society does, right? Does the same thing. You know, good boy, you did what we told you, regardless of what you felt on the inside. Good girl, you did what, we told you what we agree with, regardless of what it felt on the inside. We're not against if it happens to also be what you want to do, right? But, but the reward is there for doing what we think you should do, not for doing what is coming up from inside you, right? Similarly, um, the punishment, right? Bad girl, bad boy. My dogs are cringing over there. Uh, I, I can't turn the camera, but like they're really upset now, right? That's how well trained they are, even though they're not doing anything, right? Something must be wrong, right? You ever felt like that? Like you don't even know what's wrong. You just feel like, I don't know, I'm wrong, right? It, it, and we go into situations already feeling wrong. We go into situations already thinking there's something wrong. And then we start to do things that we think will get us approval, right? We do the things that maybe got us approval as kids. We do the things that maybe got us approval as adults. We do the things that maybe got us approval in a relationship or at work. And sometimes they work and we get a pet on the head and a good boy, good girl. And sometimes they don't. And we, we, we don't get the pat on the head. We don't get the good girl. And maybe 
It's even so bad we get the bad boy, bad girl. But because we internalize it with thought, right? At a certain point, the world doesn't even need to be there anymore for us to hold ourselves back, for us to wait for permission to run free, to think free, to go anywhere, to do anything. And as it looks to me, right, and, and this is just what it looks like to me, the mechanism that we use to keep ourselves in place, the mechanism we use to stay leashed, even when there's no actual leash holding us back, is judgment, right? We judge ourselves, good boy, bad boy, good girl, bad girl, right? And we use that inner judgment, which is all coming from thought, to try and keep ourselves in check. And it happens so fast, we, you, we mostly don't notice ourselves doing it. We just notice, yeah, I, I can't do that. Yeah, I, no, I'm not the, I mean, it almost feels like you're hitting an electric fence, right? They have these invisible fences you can put up now for your pets. And it basically, they've got something on their throat and there's a wire under the ground and they get a little bit of a shock when they go over the invisible fence. So even though you don't see anything there, they learn, oh, don't go there, right? Well, we learn that too. We get a little jolt of thought in certain situations. We go, I don't, want, I don't want that. And so our world gets smaller. It gets fenced in. Safety seems to start to be a function of certain areas of life and not a natural state. I'm safe when I'm here. I'm safe when I'm doing these things. I'm safe when I'm with these people. And suddenly what started out as a birthright what started out as being born into mental health now feels like something we've got to earn and something that we can lose or can be taken away from us if we do the wrong things. Our freedom seems like something we can have if, we can have when, we can have up to a point. And, but it's okay because I've got all this conditioning, I've got all this training, I've got all these judgments inside that'll keep me safe and it'll keep me from hurting other people, or keep me from whatever it is. Like, have you ever actually asked yourself, what is it that you're so afraid is so horrible about you, that if you weren't continually trying to motivate yourself with punishment and reward, with judgments and threats and promises, what, what is it you think you do? Like for me, it was have sex with the Swedish volleyball team. Like that was it, that was my, that was my big fear. If I was unleashed, that's what I would do. And I did not think my wife would like it, right? Now that hopefully sounds as insane to you now as it does to me now, but at the time I was seriously worried about it, right? It doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. What you've made up about the horrors you would unleash on the world if you were free is made up. The standard according to which you judge good girl, bad girl, good boy, bad boy, you didn't pick it. And if you did, you picked it off someone else's menu. And yet, there is something inside human beings that is so inherently good, that is so inherently connected to life itself, that left to our own devices, we're messengers of the light. We're the hand of mind. We're a vehicle for this intelligence, for this deeper energy behind life, for this implicate order. That's that aliveness that I see in my dogs when I let them off lead. That's in us. That's the spark of life itself. And if we let it catch flame, if we let ourselves catch flame, we burn bright without ever burning out. But when we don't think it's enough, when we pour gasoline of thinking onto the fire, well, that can burn out. That can burn out pretty quick. When we artificially try to fan the flames, by scaring ourselves, 
or promising ourselves and we get sort of lustful for things or fearful of things. Well, that will burn you out pretty quickly. That's, that's like lighter fluid. It's, it's not made to be long, long burning, right? The light of life, the energy of life, mind in us. Well, that's always been, that always will be. That can neither be diminished nor enhanced. One of the metaphors for it, so you'll look in, if you study various religious and spiritual texts, you'll find that there are metaphors for this in every religion I've seen, in every spiritual tradition I've seen. In the Kabbalah, they talk about the light of God, right? Pure consciousness, pure mind, pure thought, the source. And they say that it is so bright that man, mankind, can't look directly at it, or, or it would blind us. So there are 23 veils of illusion between us and the light, right? 23 layers of thought between us and the light. Now, I don't know if you, uh, if this was an American thing, but I think most college dorms, you know, have the thing where you take the the Moroccan cloth or the, 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 I don't know what you call the thing you, you like cowboys used to put around their bandanas, right? You put it over the light and it kind of creates this mood lighting in the room. Well, it's like that. And if you had 23 of those, there's not much light in the room. But each veil of illusion, each kerchief, each bandana that you pull off, the light seems brighter. The room gets easier to see. It's easier to navigate the warmth of the light starts to come through. The light never changes, but there's less between us and it, which is why when we wake up to the fact of thought and another layer of thinking falls away, we feel closer to the light. We feel more alive. The world is easier to navigate. The room is lighter. It's easier to see what's really going on. And when it's easier to see what's going on, we do better, right? If you play golf at night, it's really hard, right? Even with a flashlight, right? If you play it in the early morning light, it's easier. And if you play it in the middle of the day, it's easier, right? It's just easier to play the game of life when we can see. And the only obstacle to us seeing are the layers, the veils, of illusion, of thought. And so each insight we have into the nature of thought for ourselves, every time we, we go, oh God, that's, that's thought. That's not happening. That's not doing anything to me. That's not the world making me happy or the world making me sad or the world keeping me small or the world giving me a break. That's just an experience of thought in the moment. Right? That's all we got. But that experience of thought in the moment is more or less illuminated. It's more or less enlightened, depending on how many layers of thinking there are between us and the light, between us and the spark. Right? How insulated do you want to be from life? Right? Because if you want to be insulated from life, just keep thinking. Right? That will insulate you. And the more you think, the more insulated you'll be. But the problem is, we crave aliveness. We crave that feeling of being alive. We crave that connection to a deeper intelligence. We crave that deeper love. We, we, that's what we want. And so we insulate ourselves against it and then wonder why we're not feeling it. And if we get really lost, instead of stripping away some of the old insulation, we turn around and try to create our own fire from, our, from the world. Ah, oh, well, maybe if I find the right job, I'll find the fire. Maybe if I find the right partner, I'll find the fire. Maybe if I make enough money, I'll find the fire. Maybe if I join the right club, I'll find the fire. But the fire's already going inside you. You're made of the fire. But we've got a lot of insulation. 
Now, I don't know why we're set up that way, right? That's beyond my ken. That's outside of my, above my pay grade, as George Pransky would say. But it seems pretty evident to me that we've all got it. We all have more or less insulation from life, from love, from purity of thought, purity of consciousness, purity of mind. And the funny thing is, it looks like the obstacle is the conditioning. Well, yeah, what am I going to do, though? I was born on this planet. I was conditioned. I do have good dog, bad dog, good girl, bad girl in my head. What am I supposed to do? Well, what I've seen in the work I've done generally, but in, the, in this field for the last 10 years, is it is so much more a question of willingness than it is of anything else. At some level, we stay limited because we think it's safer. We think it's a better idea than being free. Right? It looks like a good idea to us. Right? And, and the funny thing is, see, here, here's, here's how I used to see this even before I came across the principles. I would have clients and they would come to me and they would say, um, oh man, I worry so much. I worry about everything. I worry about this. I worry about that. And I would say, if I could wave a magic wand and make it so that you would never worry again, you could never worry again, would you want me to wave the magic wand? And I do not remember a single person saying yes. Now, a lot of them said, well, I'd love it if you could take it down from a 10 to a 2. I'd love it if you could make it so I only worried here, but not here. But at some level, everybody thought that worry was either keeping them safe or motivating them to take action. And that if they didn't worry, they wouldn't do the good girl, good boy things. And they would do the bad boy, bad girl things. And that's the same reason that we're not probably experiencing life with as much freedom as we would like, with as much joy as we would like, with as much love as we would like. Because at some level, we think the insulation is important. We think the conditioning is, look, yeah, of course, I'd like better conditioning. You know, I wish I'd been trained by a better dog trainer. But no, the conditioning, I mean, you know, my parents loved me. That's why they did it. Well, yeah. Right? Right? This, th there is a genuine care often behind the conditioning we receive. When you're little, right? When you're precognitive, you genuinely don't know enough to not run into the street. You don't understand how streets work. So parents usually unwittingly take advantage of the natural fear of loud noises that's been built into all animals biology, right? And they go, stop! And we freeze. Right? And we associate that with not the street. And so like, we don't want to have anything to do with the street. And while we are precognitive, that's fantastic. But see, it doesn't stop when we start to understand how streets work. We still feel that fear. And then eventually it does. Right? Eventually, for most of us, we don't have to be afraid of traffic to not run in it because we have a deeper understanding of how life works, a deeper understanding of how traffic works. Fear is a, a, a temporary substitute for understanding. Worry is, is, is a poor substitute for that inner flow of intelligence, of knowing, of responsive wisdom in the moment because we don't trust that there is a responsive, reliable intelligence, we worry. We sometimes call it planning. But honestly, how long does it take to plan something? Well, I think I'll do this and then maybe that. Okay, I got a plan. But we don't plan like that. No, we plan for every eventuality. That's not planning. That's worrying. That's not realizing that you'll know what to do when you're in the situation far more than you can know what to do before it happens. The view from the field is not the view from the stands. 
the experience of being in the game is not the experience of watching from the sidelines. Often people will watch a, a great teacher, a great coach, uh, a great performer in any field, and, and they'll watch them respond to things. And they go, man, I, I could never do that. Well, actually, if you were in the game, present, things would occur to you to do that don't occur to you when you're watching from the sidelines. It's a false conclusion that because when I'm watching from over here, I don't know what to do. When I'm thinking about it before it happens, I don't know what I would do. When I'm actually there, actually it's remarkable how well people do in crisis, right? Have you noticed that? That it is more often than not, something extra comes out of us in crisis. So the very situations we try to avoid are often the situations where that deeper part of us comes through. And it's just because in those, there's something in us, our wisdom, our innate intelligence, that knows, yeah, I can't afford to be up in my head right now. I can't worry about the voice in my head saying, bad dog. I just need to go. I just need to respond. I just need to be in this moment. And we all do really well in the moment. We're made to thrive in the moment. The entire human mechanism, the principles behind life are designed to work perfectly in the moment. And we can use them to project into imaginary futures and imaginary pasts. And I say imaginary because they're in our imagination. Even if the thing you are imagining may have actually happened at one point, it is not happening now. Therefore, it is an imagined past. Even though the thing you are imagining in the future might happen, in the moment you're experiencing an imagined future, a future made up in your imagination. Images, I don't know what a nation means, so I'm going to have to stop that one. But if somebody speaks Latin at some point, they'll explain it to me. Right? And so... We have an innocent lack of faith in mind. And that means the next best thing for us to try to rely on is our conditioning. And because most of us can recognize that there are huge chunks of our conditioning that really are messy, then the next best thing is to try and recondition ourselves. So we try to replace bad thoughts with good thoughts, bad beliefs with good beliefs, limiting perspectives with enlivening opening perspectives. But we're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. We're just moving around imaginary furniture in this imaginary world. When underneath at all times is the deeper mind. I don't have the um, book in front of me. I gave my last copy away to a client over the weekend. But there's a quote in the missing link in the section on mind that I love where it essentially says every human being has the ability to align their personal mind with the divine mind. And in so doing, experiences harmony throughout their lives. That's the potential. We're made to live in sync with the flow of life. It expresses through us as energy, as aliveness, as an animating force. It expresses through us as a wisdom, an intuitive sense. It expresses through us in common sense. We navigate by obviousness. But if we don't think that there is an intelligence that we can rely on, if we think it's on us to work it all out, to figure it all out, well, then of course we're going to do our best within the conditioning we have given the thinking we have that looks real to us and not like thought. And that's the payoff to spending time exploring thought. Because you start to get a feel for it. You start to see it more. And when you see thought, it doesn't own you. 
in the way that it does when you don't see it for what it is. That's the beauty of looking to the formless before the form. Consciousness as pure awareness, as a capacity to experience. Mind as, as, as a, a pure intelligence before the form, before the therefore, before the because, before the word. And when we look within, we look upstream, we look before the form. It does something for us. It settles us down. It brings us back to the moment without us having to do anything to get there. Because really, we never left the moment. We just thought we did. So to my mind, it's a worthwhile inquiry if you can do it without getting, without taking it too seriously. Like, I must figure this out, right? We, 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 can, we can really benefit from looking to see what, what is it that we're so afraid of? What is it that we think we'll do, that mind will do, if we let mind steer, if we let the deepest part of ourselves steer the ship? Like for me, I, I, I really thought, well, yeah, one day I should do that. But I know it's going to make me do worthy stuff. And I don't want to do worthy stuff. I don't want to have to go to the Middle East and create peace. I like doing cartoon voiceovers. Right? That sounds stupid, but honest to God, that was my biggest dilemma for years. Is I thought surrendering to mind meant doing what I thought of had in a, in a box called worthy stuff I really must do one day. But if I did what I wanted to do, it would be fun. My experience has been exactly the opposite of that. When I go with my inner knowing, I love what comes. It's unexpected. It's surprising. It's beyond my imagination. When I try to make my plans happen, sometimes they work out and it's okay and it's kind of good. And sometimes they don't. <laughs> but that's it. There's no juice in it because it doesn't come from the source of the juice. There's a... controversial, I guess it is controversial, um, translation of the Ten Commandments. And it's based on uh, a, a, a scholar who pointed out that the word, and I don't I think it was in Aramaic, but the word for shall and shall not is the same as the word for will and will not, that those are just, it can be translated either way. And his contention is that the Ten Commandments properly translated, and I make no I'm just saying, I have, I, I don't know. When you take God into your heart, you will have no other gods before him. When you take God into your heart, you will not kill. When you take God into your heart, you will not bear false witness. When you take God into your heart, you will not covet your neighbor's wife. I'm going to stop before I reveal that I don't actually know all 10 of them, but the point being, that seems to me more in line with how the world seems to work, with how we seem to work. When we are aligned with the universal, when we align ourselves with that divine spark in us, we actually behave in all the ways that all that moral coding is designed to make us behave. We actually behave in all the ways that all our conditioning is designed to try and force us to behave. So in fact, our deeper nature is not Lord of the Flies. It's, I want to say Lord of the Rings, but that didn't end much better. You know, it's, it's different. <laughs> it's not this chaotic, small self greedy, like that's in us too, because that's part of the conditioned world. But that actually surrendering to, aligning with, aligning our will with the will of life. Mm. 
we're naturally compassionate. We're naturally loving. We're naturally understanding. And we have a natural sense of safety and danger. We're much quicker to pick up when uh, somewhere is a no-go area because we're present to it. So we don't need the voice of the adult shouting in our head going, no, which causes us to not only avoid a real and present danger, but any danger we can imagine. And the thing about our imaginations is they're great. We can imagine so much danger, right? There's stranger danger. There's, there's cliff danger. There's heights danger. There's love danger. There's relationship danger. There's doggy danger. I mean, it's endless. But we have so much on our mind that the one danger that we often miss is any clear and present danger. Unless it's sufficiently clear and present that it cuts through our thinking, wakes us back up, and we're able to respond. See, the very conditioning that is designed to keep us safe doesn't. It actually makes us less conscious, less present, less responsive, less aware. The very conditioning that's designed to make us successful in the eyes of whatever culture we're supposed to be successful within, right? And there are different rules in a religious culture than in a um, secular culture, than in a Western culture, than in an Eastern culture, than in an Oceanic culture. Success is measured in very different ways, right? But if we strive for something outside of ourselves, because of that conditioning, we ignore the movement inside us. Or we find it in our hobbies. But I still have to do this for work. I used to, um, my brother actually did rally driving. I don't know if you, you know, where, where somebody drives really fast and somebody's next to them um, shouting out instructions in real time, looking at a, you know, you know, turn one degree ahead. And, and, and it's this really incredibly real time sport and it's a very dangerous sport. And I sometimes think that the way we navigate life as opposed to the way we're designed to navigate life is we're like rally drivers who spend most of our time ignoring the voice next to us that has the map. And so we're just going, I don't know, it looks like this is a good idea, right? And, and because of the speed of life, that, that often doesn't work out so well. But if we stay tuned to this responsive intelligence, this deeper mind, it's got it. We're so in sync that we almost know what it's going to say before it says it. There's a beautiful feeling to that dance. My brother used to tell me he loved doing that because it was so aligned, right? His little thinking brain, and it wasn't a little thinking brain. He's got quite a big thinking brain, but his big little thinking brain didn't have to run the show. And since it's not made to run the show, it relaxed. Right? My daughter Clara has thought that she should be the queen of the universe since at least the age of three. I suspect she thought so before the age of three, but she didn't. She was she was pre-verbal, so we don't know for a fact that she did. But she pretty much declared it from the age of three on. And it fascinated me as she grew up that much as she fought for and demanded to be in charge. Whenever we made it clear that she wasn't, her whole being relaxed. She was delighted to not have to be in charge of the universe because it was a big job for a six-year-old and a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old and a 21-year-old. Well, it's a big job for a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 50-year-old and a 60-year-old and a 70-year-old as well. Fortunately, it's not actually our job. We just think it is. And when we see that it's not on us to command the oceans, 
to spin the planet, to make sure Bob shows up to the meeting on time, to make sure we do all the right things at all the right times by the designation ordained on us by our imaginations. Well, life gets really simple. It's really straightforward. We play, we explore, we connect. Right? That's what my dogs do up on Dirt Mulholland every time. They play, they explore, they connect with other dogs, other humans, other beings. And they have the best time. We're already unleashed. That experience is on offer 24-7 for everyone. And it's as close as now. <laughs> like nothing has to happen first. And my hope is that because we've talked about this, you'll start to notice yourself doing it to yourself. You'll start to notice yourself judging yourself, holding yourself back, going good girl, bad girl, good dog, bad dog. Trying to motivate yourself, give you motives for doing the right thing. Instead of just listening to the rally driver, just listening to the navigator, just aligning your will with the will of life, with the deeper mind, and creating harmony in your life and harmony in the world. I think I better shut up if I want to take questions. So I'm going to do that. And uh, you, you can tell me how this works. OK. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. To raise your hand, if you click on the participant um, button on the bottom, there's a little raise hand there. And if you can't do that, you can unmute yourself. Just be respectful. If someone else is talking, please. Sue, do you have a question prepared? OK. Let's see. OK. You should be on me. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Hey, Sue. How are you doing? I am well, thank you. Good. Sorry about the giant cat earlier. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, just, just for one moment. I thought you'd been devoured I, <laughs> by a tabby. Yeah. Um, my question is, obviously, you know, sort of a lot of uh, mentors in the principles conversation, they say, you know, don't take life so seriously and, and you know, be a bit light-hearted about it. But how can you do that, yeah, where you've restricted your life to four walls? You know, I feel like I'm kind of been sent to prison without even committing a crime. So how can you kind of be light-hearted about life? when you're in that kind of situation? So, I'm, I'm gonna take a permission here, okay. which is to just speak and to trust that if I say something that doesn't fit, you're gonna say, I don't get that. So would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay. You may have hear people um, say, be lighthearted. I, I, I don't think that I say that. I think what I point to as best I can again and again and again is that the nature of the heart is light. And that but for the layers of heavy thought that we put on it, we yeah. simply experience life in a lighthearted way because that's natural. But for the seriousness we put into our thinking, we experience life quite delightfully. It's just so simple. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get that. Yeah. And obviously I've got layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of thinking. Yeah. That will need yeah. a chainsaw to get rid of at the minute. Well, but see, here's the cool thing. There, there, and this is just within your chainsaw metaphor. You can take a chainsaw to an ice cube or you can 
let it sit in the sun for a little while. Yeah. And then you don't, it, it, the, the result is inevitable, even if the timing is up for grabs. Yeah. Right. When we look at any thought again in the light of consciousness, in the light of truth, it, 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 if it isn't real, it dissolves and something new takes its place. Totally true. Yeah. I've seen that more the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just that obviously over the years, I've just condensed myself to these four walls with my thinking yeah. you know and and you know i want to be light i want to be happy regardless of the circumstances prisoners are happy i mean that it, it really you know it, i it, it always sounds to me like a line except that i was there and it was said to me when i went the first time i went into the prisons one of the prisoners came up to me afterwards and said who knew I would have to come to prison to learn to be free? Yeah. Right? It's pretty incredible that is, isn't it? You know, pretty but, incredible. But that's just us. I mean, that's us in a nutshell. Like we're the, we're, the, we're, the, we're the full potential of the entire universe and we've shrunk our world down to four walls. Literally, yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to... Um, because still I've got loads of thinking, I'm not quite sure how to, to, to open the door and walk through. Because I have the freedom to do that. Yeah. But for my thinking. Well, it's not even but for your thinking. It's but for your thought looking real to you. <laughs> yeah, that's my issue, yeah. Because the layers metaphor has an edge, right? It's just a metaphor. There aren't really layers. It's just one big bundle of pixie dust. We're crappy pixie dust. Okay, we're mixing metaphors here. But, but like, you know what I mean? It looks solid until you go. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much pixie dust there was. Wow. It doesn't matter how many years it took to co coagulate as a pixie dust ball. Right, one breath of fresh insight, and it's gone. Wow, yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. You're super. Thank you. Cool. Who's got next? I'm guessing somebody other than me is in charge of the board because I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. It's uh, Myrna. Yes, I can. Hey, Myrna. Yeah. Hi. Um, actually, I was uh, I participated in your advanced course 3.0. Yeah. In July, and uh, at that point, I couldn't see myself creating anything. I even read your book. You know, creating what is it called? The impossible. the impossible yes 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 but after that i've i've started to write and um uh i started to write and i sent a, a letter to the editor in the region where i live mm -hmm. they published it and then i again i felt like i needed to write something about how i felt our community was was developing and when I wrote again, I sent it to the publisher, uh, to the newspaper, and they published it again. Mm -hmm. And I felt that something that, well, I guess what you're, t you're talking about all the time, if, you, if I just link myself to something greater than myself, I, I lose all the inhibitions. Mm -hmm. It's like being unleashed, and it really feels good. So I'm, first of all, I'm grateful for that. So thank you. You're welcome. The second yeah, the so it does feel is, a little bit like you're thanking me for the human design, but you know, I, I'll, I'll take credit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <you're> welcome. <laughs> well, you pointed me in the right direction. There you go. Okay. Let's put it that way. I'll take that. I said, the second thing is something that you said tonight or tonight my time. Uh, I'm, I've been raised in a Catholic school in a Catholic family, and I always had this guilty feeling that I need to save the world. 
because it needs saving. And I, I'm 65. And the thing is, all my life, I felt that, gee, I'm not doing enough because I need to save the world. But I know I, I'm not going to the Middle East. I'm, yeah. you know, that's not, I couldn't do that. But I felt like I'm not doing what I should be doing. But based on what you said tonight, I don't have to. I can save my world in my way and it's okay. So I guess this feeling that maybe not just I have, but we all have to do something because there's so much chaos in the world. We don't really have to act on it, on this. I don't know where it comes from, but may, for me, it's from my Catholic background because there's so much guilt that I've learned. Sure. Look, um, it comes from take on that. It, it, it comes from generations of well-meaning people with limited vision trying to describe what they see to the next generation to prepare the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like a game of telephone or Chinese whispers, right? Each iteration, it gets a little further from reality and a little further from reality. And it, and it doesn't take into account that what we're calling reality changes. Mm -hmm. with thought and over time. So I don't think there's any malintent to the majority of it. It's, it's, it's just old data. It's like trying to drive across the United States with a 1930s road atlas. It's going to be of limited use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact that you can still experience that total freedom in moments Mm -hmm. right? It's just mm -hmm. seeing that's available to you everywhere. I wrote a blog a couple of weeks back called a get out of jail free card for your life. And it mm -hmm. was based on, I did a seminar with Anita Morjani um, who had a near death experience and sort of had a, her own sort of enlightenment experience during that time. And, and she was, she was talking about how the one thing she saw when she died mm -hmm was that th there, there are no prerequisites for love. Like there is literally nothing you can do that will make any more love than the love of the universe available to you. And there's nothing you can do that will make any less love than the love of the universe available to you. I That's see. what the principles point to as well. We are all made of love. How can anything we do give us more or less than it? We are inside the, 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 this was a metaphor I used yesterday for those of you who were on that call, right? We're, we're sitting in a hot tub of love, right? We're in love, in the hot tub okay. with everybody. Yeah. We're already in there. And if we're reading a book in there, we're still in the hot tub. And if we're playing sports in there, we're still in the hot tub. And if we're in relationship in there, we're in the hot tub. If we're single in there, we're in the hot tub. If we're going to the Middle East to try and sort out conflict, we're in the hot tub. And if we're sitting in a voiceover studio doing cartoon voices, we're in the hot tub. And it's like a get out of jail free card for your life. Right? You're not on the hook for it. That doesn't seem to me to be why we're here. It's not up to me. <laughs> Unless you're the one, right? Because uh -huh. it certainly isn't up to any of the other hundreds of thousands of people I've come across in my life. And it would seem a little unlikely that you'd be the one. <laughs> yes. Unless your, last, unless your last name is Al, <laughs> in which case you are meant to carry the world on your shoulders, but... Okay, um, my, my last question, how does the three principles play a part in, you know, the global conflict that's happening all over the place? Are there uh, 3P uh, teachers, coaches who are coaching leaders who are making the decisions that, is there somebody coaching Trump? I'm not aware of anyone coaching <laughs> Trump at the moment. Uh, I've been waiting for the call. It hasn't been. I, you know, hang on, maybe it's no, not yet. But but actually, yeah, no. There there there. There's a lot of really hopeful stuff happening in in all sorts of parts of the world. 
um, you know, some of it that, that, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they've had, uh, you know, Mara, Mara and Eric Olson talk about mm-hmm. the work they're doing at the moment yeah. with the gangs in Chicago. There's work going on in Kenya. There are, you know, there, there, there are things that are being talked about and things that aren't being talked about, um, where that are where happening at, at the high ends of the, um, cultural hierarchy and at the lower ends of the cultural hierarchy are being introduced to this understanding. So yeah, I do see a lot of cool stuff happening, but I also think there's, it it would be a mistake to go, okay, we got to do more Mm -hmm. because that's just chasing another idea. Like if, if this is going to be the unfolding, then it's going to unfold. And if we're aligned, if we are in harmony, if we, align our mind our personal mind with the deeper mind and there's something for us to do then we'll know to do it it's that simple so yeah as it happens i think the world is changing and being supported and moving in a different direction but unless and until i get my next marching orders Mm -hmm. I, i i'm not inclined to make something up Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Myrna. So I've got time to keep going if there's any going to be done. Um, otherwise, we can uh, we can call it over to you. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure when you join us, so thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Nice to see everyone. Yeah, and I just want to let everybody know the next webinar is October 31st, and it's with Mark Howard, so I hope you can all join us live then. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye.